Talk to you. Recorded live. Hello, this is Michael Adams from Nothing But the Truth. It's January 5th, 2015, and we're going to start out with the headlines from Yahoo.com. All right, looks like uh, headline number three, Vatican turns to the left, will make the poor poorer. This is from Forbes magazine, Pope Francis. And I say this as a Catholic, <clears throat> and it's, I'm referring to obviously the, uh, the, folk, the person who wrote this article. It is a complete disaster when it comes to his public policy from announcements, now referring to Pope Francis, on the economy and even more so on the environment. The Pope has allied himself with the far left. And you can read more on that in, on Forbes magazine. <clears throat> Let's see the next article. Looks like Article 8. Pope Francis breaks tradition with new cardinal list. Pope Francis announced Sunday the list of names to join the College of Cardinals of the Catholic Church. And you can learn more about that on Zoom In TV. And let's see what else we got. That's just a little side note. Uh, <clears throat> you have not been helpful, in quotes. Monk loses temper dealing with United Airlines uh, customer service. This Yahoo News, Brother Noah of the Monastery of Christ in the desert of New Mexico says he was so frustrated with the customer service for United Airlines. And you can read more about that. So another United Airlines article in the past couple of weeks. Frontline's got an article about uh, guns, gun down, or is it a new episode, I should say, from, uh, mm, it looks like Frontline on PBS, of course, pushing the agenda to get rid of the guns. Uh, Pope Francis named 20 cardinal, cardinals, many from developing, wor- from developing world. This is uh, AFP. Uh, Pope Francis named 20 new car- cardinals, a majority of them from Africa, Asia, and Latin America. That should be suggest something, huh? Uh, my Myanmar Catholics, please welcome first local cardinal. And then it says a Yangon Myanmar Myanmar. And I don't know. There's some place somewhere in the, on this planet. This is from the Associated Press. Church colleagues on Monday proudly welcome home Archbishop Charles uh, Myong Bo. And you can learn more about that. And let's see one more. Here's another one. Oh, they keep on the, a lot of articles about the, the new list of cardinals. And let's see. We go one more. And then I will bring on the show if there's anything worth looking at. My point, folks, once again, the reason why I'm doing this is because if you, you should ask the question, why does this particular organization have so many of the headlines? <clears throat> and uh, with that, I think I'll just leave it at that. Most of it is about the new Cardinals, so apparently it's a big deal to Yahoo.com. So with that, uh, folks, we've got... Uh, you, York from Juggler 66 on, along with Tom Fress. We're going to go back to uh, uh, reading from uh, the characteristics Antichrist. So, York, how are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you, Michael. And I uh, just want to help you out with uh, Myanmar, what you just read. Uh, that used to be the country of Burma. Oh, really? Okay, thank you for helping me out. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah. Thanks for the introduction and uh, a warm welcome to our brother in Christ, uh, Tom Fress, who will help us analyze um, the different characteristics of Antichrist that we have been reading so far. And we will today continue with um, characteristic number 14. Tom, uh, are you all right? Yes, fine. And uh, thanks for inviting me. And uh, nice to be here. And 
nice to uh, be in such good company. It's a pleasure having you on the show, Tom. Uh, I really have to say that. So, without further ado, I will uh, turn to characteristic number 14 of the 26 that we can get on the website www.remnantofarc.com. Uh, characteristic number 14 is called The Antichrist is to preach another Jesus unto all. And we start with a little quote from the King James Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 to 4. Quote, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. End quote. Is the Jesus of Rome, the Jesus of the Bible, well, they use the same name, that's all. Notice a few of the teachings of Rome. Does this sound like they preach the Jesus of the Bible? It's truly this easy to see this prophecy fulfilled. All one needs is to open the Bible and then open the Roman Catholic Catechism book. And now we'll follow a little sum up of different points where you can see when you compare it to the Bible that the Roman Catholic Church is probably teaching another Jesus than the Jesus that is in the Bible, the Word of God. Do they preach Jesus when they glorify Mary as co-redeemer? Do they preach Jesus when their priestly ambassadors of Jesus are drunks, smokers, child molesters, thieves, and murderers? Do they preach Jesus while killing 500 million Christians during the Dark Ages? Or do they preach Jesus while placing tradition over and above the scripture? Do they preach Jesus when they teach purgatory instead of salvation in Jesus? Do they preach Jesus when teaching you must suffer to be saved, making the cross insufficient? Do they preach Jesus while going to man for forgiveness instead of God Almighty? Do they preach Jesus when the Pope says, quote, evolution is fact, unquote, making Jesus the creator a liar? Do they preach Jesus when they teach gambling as acceptable Christ-like activity? Do they preach Jesus when the Pope praises and embraces Buddhism on global news networks? Do they preach Jesus when they preach that, quote, fellow believers, unquote, stone Stephen on EWTN? Do they preach Jesus when the Pope preaches mankind can protect you better than God? Do they preach Jesus when the Pope preaches you must be loyal to him to be saved? Or do they preach Jesus when they teach you must bow down to the Pope and kiss his feet, which is papal worship and the worship of man before the worship of God? Do they preach Jesus while killing millions for merely reading his Bible? Do they preach Jesus when they ignore Jesus' example and baptize babies as the pagans? Do they preach Jesus when they put his Bible on the list of forbidden books back in 1229 AD? Or do they preach Jesus when they venerate crosses, statues, images, relics, etc.? Do they preach Jesus when they sell indulgences, making the cross insufficient? Or do they preach Jesus when they preach you must worship a waiter, instead they parade, uh, instead they parade for you? Do they preach Jesus when they preach a cloth scapula, will save you instead of Jesus? Do they preach Jesus when they put books in the Bible, Jesus nor the apostles ever quoted or used? Do they preach Jesus when they say Mary was, quote, utterly without sin, unquote? Do they preach Jesus when call the Pope infallible and Jesus was fallible? Do they preach Jesus when the Pope himself states to all the world, quote, unquote, he is God on earth? Do they preach Jesus when the Pope proclaims that the church is a must for salvation? Do they preach Jesus when they make war with the saints of Jesus, as prophecy said Antichrist would do? 
do that preach Jesus when they slowly torture followers of Jesus to death? Do they preach Jesus when they destroy entire nations? Do they preach Jesus when they abolish the Sabbath that Jesus kept and sanctified and adopt the pagan day of, sun, of the sun? Well, I would just stop reading right here because all the points I've read right now, I think every one of those points, there will be something that Tom has to say to go into even a deeper explanation. Uh, Tom, do you want to do that, or do you want me to continue just the whole article and then go into a few of these points and adjust that? Because I think that your mind is almost blown with the things that you have to say to each of these points right now. Well, like I said on a previous broadcast, it's hard to one-up Nicholas from remnantofgod.org. He's, he's got his stuff together, and he has researched this for decades and uh, it, it's very, very difficult to add anything to what Nicholas says. Like I say before, this website is probably the most comprehensive uh, expose of Antichrist uh, anywhere on the Internet. And, but, but I would just simply add at this point, and I want you to continue to read uh, what, what Nicholas has said, but what I would like to add is... Number one, did they preach Jesus when they said, when one of the most powerful popes of all history, one of the most powerful antichrists of all history said, Pope Boniface VIII said, it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human person be subject to the Roman pontiff. Okay, I... I, I didn't want you to uh, to add points to this summary that I just made. I just thought that you would appreciate it to go into a few of these points more deeply. Well, I I, I think it's incumbent uh, to to lay the, these things out for the listeners and have them research them themselves. This this is where this is where uh, an expose like this really has its power. When people begin to ex, uh, to uh, research this stuff for themselves, I would add one other point, and maybe Nicholas will will include this one too. Do they preach Jesus when they say the seventieth week of Daniel is not fulfilled in history, but it is fulfilled in the future? Very good point. I'll let you continue with what Nicholas has to say. Okay. So further in the article, we read a little paragraph that's called The Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. That's actually 112 pages, so we're just reading a little part of this here from Reverend Peter Geierman. Were you aware that out of the 448 questions in this book of Catholic Doctrine, there were uh, 776 answers due to the fact that many of the questions have multiple answers? Some had as many as 17 answers to a single question. Out of all these questions regarding Catholic doctrine, there were only 56 Bible verses listed. And more than 75% of those Bible verses were taken completely out of context. Well, that's another trick they do. Just cite the Bible in one verse and take it completely out of context. Uh, I think a very good example to this would be Romans 13. Indeed. And more than 75% of those Bible verses were taken completely out of context. But let's give the Vatican the benefit of the doubt and assume that all 56 Bible verses used were in context, shall we? That should mean 56 Bible verses used for 776 answers, equating to 13.8% of the questions having Bible verses given to explain or confirm them. That means... 86.2% of the answers were not, N-O-T, not found in the Bible. End of this paragraph. A quotation from Matthew uh, 16, verse 18, quote, And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. End quote. I think, personally, this is one of the most misquoted Bible verse the Roman Catholic Church ever used to um, justify their existence. 
This single verse proves the Catholic Church is not of Jesus. The historic fact is, the gates of hell have prevailed against this church from the beginning and will do so all the way until its soon demise. If this church, they claim, was built upon the faith of Peter as Roman Catholicism, then they also proclaim Jesus Christ a liar. For even the Pope himself admitted in his mea culpa on March 12, 2000, well, we talked about that on some other places already, that the gates of hell did prevail against his church. So much so that over 500 million Christians were burned at the stake, drawn and quartered, buried alive, boiled in oil, skinned alive, and had numerous other horrendous acts of evil done against them. Is this what Jesus would have Christians do to those that don't embrace his word? Even a babe in Christ can easily proclaim no. Jesus would never do as Rome does. This continues the reading of characteristic number 14 of the Antichrist. I personally do not have very much to add here because all these questions that I've just met, they really speak for themselves. And with a lot of these questions, one don't even have to open the Bible to understand that this is not um, Jesus' teaching. Anyway, um, do you have some closing remarks on this characteristic number 14, Tom? Well, it, it, would, it would just be anticlimactic. I think Nick was, has done a fantastic job with this, as with all of his work. And uh, it ought to be taken seriously by the listeners, and I hope they will take the opportunity... Uh, to investigate all of these charges against the papacy. Uh, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, as I've said so many times on my program, it's not the Church of Jesus Christ. It should not be considered a Christian church, yet the whole world does consider it a Christian church, and it's simply because they don't know what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. They haven't compared the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church with the Bible, they don't understand the emphasis that is placed upon the papacy and what power he has in the world today over the governments of the world and how he controls the people of the world through the civil laws of every land. The civil laws of every land are to conform to Roman Catholic canon law. And that makes the Pope the global lawgiver. That, too, is blasphemy usurping the rightful throne of God. God is the lawgiver, not the Pope. And, now, and, and all of the Pope's laws run contrary to the, the holy, immutable, and eternal law of God. And uh, once one takes it upon himself to investigate these, these, these things that Nicholas is talking about, the conclusion is automatic. It's a no-brainer. And... Uh, uh, thanks to Nicholas for making it so easy to come to the right conclusions about the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, we can actually not emphasize enough what wonderful work Nicholas has done, not only on this page, but on the whole website. And that is, the re that is one of the reasons why I chose this uh, page from the website, um, to get the people aware of the Antichrist deception that is going on, not only in the churches today, but also in the secular world. When you think of all these movies, all these movies they made, like now only comes to mind uh, movies like The Omen, that um, deal with the subject of, of Antichrist. They used every means they can put their hand on to distract from the Roman Catholic Church as being the Antichrist, as identified by all the reformers that we have spoken of already. But, um, you know, the Roman Catholics call themselves Christians, like you said, Tom. And you should know how many times I get attacked when on a YouTube video People talk about Christians 
and they actually mean Roman Catholics. Catholics. Yeah. And I, and I comment on that. Do not compare Roman Catholics to Christians because Roman Catholics are no Christians, but they are deceived people who seek the Lord and were led the other way astray. And I got so many bad comments on every time that I expose this stuff. It's every time, it's not only on YouTube, but people who are frequently on YouTube watching videos on Revelation and the Antichrist and all this stuff are probably aware of it. When you call the Catholics out, you will always be attacked and attacked and attacked. And I don't care, I still keep on doing it. Well, that would make you just as unpopular as me because I experienced the same thing for doing the same thing. And we need to be reminded also that Roman Catholics are warned by their priests and their bishops uh, not to argue their religion with non-Roman Catholics, particularly for the very reason that when they begin to, uh, to argue, they expose the unbiblical teaching of that church. Now, in Roman Catholic countries, they don't have such prohibitions. And when they discuss religion with people other than Roman Catholics, they laud their church. They're proud of the anti-biblical uh, teachings of their Roman Catholic church. And they say it is the one true church of Jesus Christ, founded by Christ himself, and that if you're outside of that church, you have no salvation. And they, uh, they're very open about their anti-biblical teaching, but in America, in the United States, uh, uh, Catholics are constantly admonished not to dispute with non-Roman Catholics uh, about their religion because there are too many Protestants in the country, and if, if the reality ever sinks in what the Roman Catholic Church really is, then they will return to religious uh, discord and and such like that you and I talk about. It's not a Christian church by any stretch of the imagination. Yes, it has some of the few, uh, some a few trappings of Christianity. They name the name of Jesus Christ, but when you investigate it, they don't worship Jesus Christ at all. And uh, it's it's a literal bait and switch. And uh, uh, this was the controversy that led to the Protestant Reformation. When, when the people of Europe finally got a copy of God's holy word in their own language that they could read it for themselves, the stark reality hit them immediately. The Roman Catholic Church to which they belonged was not the Church of Jesus Christ. It was the Church of Antichrist. And, and there were so many people in agreement with that that it appeared for a long time that the Roman Catholic Church would just implode, that it would... That it would that it would turn from the most powerful institution in the world to uh, the ash bins of history. It appeared that the reality that the Pope was the Antichrist of Scripture and that the Roman Catholic Church was that scarlet harlot that rides this, the scarlet-colored beast in Revelation chapter 17, it appeared for all intents and purposes that it was the end of the Roman Catholic Church, that it would absolutely be destroyed not by weapons of destruction, but by the simple truth of the gospel. And so this is why Roman Catholics do not debate their religion with non-Roman Catholics in this country. And the, the, reason, and, and the result of that is no one bothers to make the distinction between biblical truth and the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And so, therefore, if, if it appears superficially that the Roman Catholic Church preaches Jesus, well, then they must be Christians. And then they seek to ecumenically unite all Christians together. And that, that's why the ecumenical movement is, is so successful, because they fail to understand the, 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 the facts of history and the facts of the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that Nicholas is laying out step by step through this through this characteristics of antichrist all the things that we're talking about here were common knowledge 
uh, during, 500 years ago. Common knowledge among Christians 500 years ago at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And uh, it's all been lost. Rome has had a very effective strategy as to, uh, to blind non-Roman Catholics to the abject apostasy and anti-Christ teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm, uh, I'm convinced that the only way to stop this diabolical move uh, back to the Roman Catholic Church, to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church, and after all the Protestant churches uh, came out, they resulted because so many Catholics came out of the Roman Catholic Church. And Rome has had a claim on their souls ever since the Protestant Reformation, that the Protestants made a mistake, that they abandoned the true Church of Jesus Christ, and they've made every effort since Second Vatican, uh, the Vatican, or rather, uh, the Council of Trent, to either reabsorb the Protestant churches or to annihilate them in war. And that explains all of history. And, but all of this history is unknown to Christians in this country today, and it has to be restored. One way or another, it has to be restored. And Nicholas does a fantastic job of, of, of showing why the Protestant reformers rebelled against the Roman Catholic Church and clung to Christ and the Bible. So just in other words, what you are saying is that um, the Roman Catholics tell their people don't get involved in a discussion that you only can lose. That's well said. Okay. And uh, another, th uh, another thought of this is if you can't destroy your enemy, then join him and embrace him and open doors for him to come into you. And that's exactly what the Roman Catholic Church does with this futuristic yeah. agenda teaching and ecumenism, what we call it today. And a very big part of that was, I think, uh, Vatican II that took place in the 60s that started the ecumenic uh, movement, right? Well, that, absolutely. Well, actually, Vatican Council II was a declaration that the war against Protestantism had been won. Vatican Council II was simply an ultimatum to the Roman Catholic Church. You've admit, or excuse me, an ultimatum to the Protestant churches, the rebel churches in Rome's eyes. Vatican Council II was simply this. For generations now, you Protestants have believed in a future Antichrist. And by doing so, you have exonerated the papacy of that role in the world. Therefore, the Protestant Reformation, by your own admission, was an error and a grievous assault against the divine right authority of the Pope to rule all the churches and to rule all the kings of the earth. Vatican Council II was just putting down in paper a record of of Protestants unwitting capitulation to the Roman Catholic Church. They had believed futurism for generations. Ever since the early 1800s, futurism began <clears throat> to gain more and more and more ground in the Protestant churches. But when you believe in a future Antichrist, you inadvertently exonerate all the popes of history. And therefore, you indict the Protestant Reformation as an error, an assault against the rightful throne of God on the earth, the pope. Now, Vatican Council II could not have happened without futurism. Vatican Council II could not have happened without the World Council of Churches. And the World Council of Churches was just a way to gather in all the Protestant churches into a big organization to kind of, to kind of uh, uh, consolidate their authority, their, their recognition in the world, and to somehow try to gloss over the divisions that lie between the various Protestant churches. But in effect, what it really was 
was not un unification of Protestants together and to iron out their theological differences, but to put them under one central authority, the World Council of Churches. And nobody, nobody re remembered to tell the Protestant churches that Rome created the World Council of Churches to get them all together and then to receive from the World Council of Churches the teaching syllabus of the churches. They all began to teach the same thing. And what was that? Futurism. So from 1800 and the creation of, of, of the World Council of Churches and the National Council of Churches and all these other ecumenical national and international uh, organizations, Rome simply uh, became the teacher in the Protestant churches. And what did they teach? The main emphasis was futurism, that the, pa the Protestant reformers were wrong. It wasn't all the popes throughout history, that the Roman Catholic Church is not the woman riding the scarlet-colored beast in Revelation chapter 17, but that the pope, the Antichrist, doesn't come until the, just before Christ's return. And that's that's how Rome destroyed the Protestant Church. That is the Counter-Reformation. It began at the Council of Trent. Rome has been working this agenda ever since the Council of Trent. And Vatican Council II was a, just a, 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 a D-Day for the Roman Catholic Church. They won. It was just a signing, it was just a signing of a capitulation by the, by the Protestant churches to the Roman Catholic Church. And, and, and since that signing, since that, since that determination was made at, a, at, at, at Vatican Council II, the Roman Catholic priests, bishops, Jesuits, all the power of the Roman Catholic Church together with the, the, the so-called Christian right, who are all futurists, have seen Vatican Council II as a religious and political mandate. Now, Catholics and Protestants agree. Now, Catholics and Protestants uh, comprise the greatest political and religious power in this country. It's a majority, a supermajority, Catholics and Protestants together. And they have a mandate now to repair the damage that was done at the Protestant Reformation, both politically and religiously. The ecumenical movement has two wings. One is religious, that we're all going to share the Mass together. That's what Rome's goal is, that the Protestant churches begin to believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the, in the sacrificial bread at Communion. And they're going, to, they're going to eat and drink damnation to themselves. They're going to call it another sacrifice. Okay, that's the religious goal of the Roman Catholic Church. But they have a much, much larger political goal. And that is to see to it that the Constitution of the United States is destroyed, that the, that the liberties that were won for us by the Protestant Reformation, the freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, uh, the, the non-establishment clause, that the government should not establish a particular religion, that religious liberty should be free, that is all going to be destroyed because of the political mandate now in existence because of Vatican Council II and, and the surrender of the Protestant churches back to the Roman Catholic Church. Rome has a, a, an excuse now to do what she intended to do from the very beginning of this country, is to eliminate those Protestant liberties. Now we may not criticize the Pope or the King. We may not speak a word against the government, because just like the old world order, the government and the Roman Catholic Church are now once again united and because the governments are now in service to the papacy, the governments of the world now share the papacy's sanctity. They are both united and mutually sacrosanct, and they are all-powerful. 
and they always resort to force to anybody who opposes it, anyone who speaks an, a word against it. It's just like President George W. Bush when he addressed the United Nations. He said, let us not tolerate any conspiracy theories about 9-11. If you're not with us, you're against us. That's Antichrist speaking. George W. Bush represented the government of this country, which now serves the papacy. And we're not allowed to talk about the truth of what happened on 9-11. We're not allowed to accuse our own government. We're not allowed to say that the Vatican had anything to do with it. And if we do, then we're labeled domestic terrorists or a threat to this unity, this sacrosanct unity between church and state in the United States. And uh, they've made preparations well for the destruction of what remains, what little, what very little remains of Protestantism in this country. And all of that is because the Protestants capitulated to Rome. By believing in a future Antichrist, they exonerated the papacy, and they handed on a silver platter to the popes the exoneration that the popes have always wanted and gave them, at the same time, divine right to rule this country both over spiritual things and temporal things. Vatican Council II was the destruction of Protestantism. It began at the Council of Trent and the creation of the Jesuit order, the Counter-Reformation, and it concluded with Vatican Council II. The only thing that's left is to to discover who are the last obstinate heretics, and then to eliminate them. Well, Tom, thank you very much. And uh, you gave me a uh, starting to talk about something uh, else because I already planned another broadcast here on uh, Nothing But The Truth um, that is dealing with the Catholic Lutheran Accord from the Lutheran World Federation on October 31st, 1999, uh, which is also mentioned in the video of Kenneth Copeland together with uh, Bishop Tony Palmer, where they uh, receive a message from Pope Francis. And if you want to see that video and an analysis and, and an anal analysis of that video, then uh, turn to my channel, Jogma66, and look for the video, One World Religion, Luther's Protest is Over, question uh, mark, where in the links you can get uh, the original video from Kenneth Copeland. By the way, uh, Kenneth Copeland in his video, after receiving some uh, comments from me, where I called him out as a snake that he is, disabled the commentary of this video. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I, I love that. I called him out a snake and a few weeks later the comments were deleted and uh, he could not post any comments anymore. Yeah. But in that sermon, uh, in, the, in the gathering, he speaks to hundreds, uh, literally even thousands of his priests and bishops in his church and uh, Tony Palmer explains why the, uh, why the protest should be over. And they also mentioned this uh, Lutheran World Federation, October 31st, 1999, where there was an accord with the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans that actually the protest is over. And there's an uh, interesting uh, article that Richard Bellet wrote on this. Uh, it's about 13 pages long, and I was uh, planning already to do a broadcast on this, uh, I will, of course, send you both the script before I do that, so you, you can check it before we do a broadcast on that. But uh, I think this will also be a very interesting point, and that goes even a little bit deeper into all that stuff that Tom just said. And uh, thank you very much, Tom, for giving me that stop word, and that I had an idea to, to come over to this. But uh, it all runs out to there must be a one-world religion because only in the church of the Roman Catholic Church there is found salvation, and not in Jesus Christ. And that's why the Pope also said some weeks ago, you cannot have a personal relationship with Jesus outside of the Roman Catholic Church. That's been always the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. If you're outside of the Roman Catholic Church, 
If you are not a subject of the papacy, you have no salvation. Right. Okay. I will go on now with um, characteristic number 15 of the Antichrist, who controls a man whose name will add to 666. Revelation chapter 13, verses 17 and 18. Quote, and that no man might buy or sell, save that he have the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and this number is six hundred three score and six. End quote. Revelation gives us a clue as to how to calculate the number of the beast. It reveals that his name will also equal this number. The name I am about to share with you is the official titles of the Pope. Thing is, for many years, most Catholics I shared this with said the name was a bogus title. I used to be a Catholic, and I did see the name itself inscribed upon the mitre of the Pope in what appeared to be jewels or diamonds many years ago. Problem is, I never made note as to where I saw them back then. So for years, it was my word against theirs. However, recently, the Lord has blessed me with an actual copy of the Catholic Weekly of April 18, 1915, wherein I found the following words. Quote, The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these, Vicarius Filii Dei, which is Latin for Vicar of the Son of God. Catholics hold that the Church, which is a visible society, must have a visible head. Christ, before his ascension into heaven, appointed St. Peter to act as his representative, hence to the Bishop of Rome, as head of the Church was given the title Vicar of Christ. Our Sunday visitor, Catholic Weekly Bureau of Information, Huntington, Indiana, April 18, 1915. And there is even a new discovery. You can look that up in the index to view page 343 of an actual Vatican document in Latin. Deus didit cardinalis, collectio canonum et ap martinici, where they use the term vicarius filii dei. For decades they have lied about this title after the truth about 666 came out. The entire book digitized online in the index. The Latin title on the page, uh, De Libertate Ecclesiae e Revum Evis et Cleri, translated, The Liberty of the Church and Her Ministers. Also see Deus Delit Bio for further verification and publishing dates. Latin is the official language of the Roman Catholic Church. Church documents are usually published first in Latin and then translated from Latin into other languages. The Association of Latinos with 666 was first suggested by Irenaeus, uh, about 130 to 202 AD, who proposed in his Against Heresies that it might be the name of the fourth kingdom in Daniel 7, uh, verse 7. It is a very profitable solution, this being the name of the last kingdom of the four seen by Daniel. For the Latins are they who, who at present bear rule. Against Heresies by Irenaeus, Book 5, Chapter 30, Paragraph 3. Sent Irenaeus Biography online at the New Advent Catholic Supersite. Since this evidence came forth regarding the title Vicarius Filii Dei and its obvious connection to the 666 calculation of Revelation, which I will, build, uh, which I will get to shortly, the Roman Church has opted to teach its followers to declare this title bogus. They have gone to great lengths seeking to do just that so as to remove the overwhelming evidence against them. Vicarius Filii Dei is cited by the rector of Berlin, Andreas Helvis, uh, between 1572 and 1643, and his Antichristus Romanos as well. You also might want to take a look at the actual facsimile of the November 15, 1914 edition of Our Sunday Visitor, a Catholic publication that openly uses the term Vicarius Filii Dei as well as the name is inscribed on the Pope's mitre. 
you can view it on this site. Uh, there's a link to the index where you can turn to if you want to check that out. Not only does that publication show the title Vicarious Fili Day, it also explains that it is considered a valid title as they do not refute that. Instead, they attempt to explain why it is a trivial matter that it equals 666. The priest writing this, uh, the article actually admits that title authentic to try and explain away its obvious 666 connection. By the way, Roman Catholic author and Jesuit priest Malachi Martin also uses the exact same title for the Pope on pages 114 and 122 of his book, The Keys of This Blood. One more note of interest. Why is it, I ask, that when you go to the archives of our Sunday visitor, that this particular edition is altogether missing? Why is it oh so difficult to get a copy of page 3 of the November 15th, 1914, Our Sunday Visitor. It will become very obvious in a moment. What I have here is a collection of titles of the Office of the Pope. This list can also be found on my Pope and 666 page in the Catholic, uh, Catholicism Exposed section of the menu. So when you turn to the website www.remnantofgod.org, go to the Catholicism Exposed section of the menu, and uh, the page Pope and 666, and you will find this, because this is dealing just with letters and numbers, and this is maybe not so easy to understand via a broadcast. So you can always look that up on the page for yourself, check there for yourself, and even probably you can use uh, some other uh, sources where this is counted out. The unique thing about the Latin language is that its alphabet serves a dual purpose. It's not only used to spell out words, it is also used as its numeric system. For example, the letter I equals 1, the letter V equals 5, the letter C equals 100, and so on. Now, all one needs to do is spell the title of the Pope. Then, you need to do, <clears throat> then all you need to do is add up the letters that are actually numbers as well. So when we go into Vicarius Filii Dei, and I spell that for you, V-I-C-A-R-I-U-S-F-I-L-I-I-D-E-I, -I -I Vicar of the Son of God, or Vicarius Filii Dei in Latin. And you take all the letters that have numbers with them, like I just explained, the V for 5, the I for 1, the C for 100, uh, the D for 500, and all the other letters, which have no numbers, are just zero. Then you will get from Vicarius 5, 1, 100, 0, 0, 1, 5, 0, adds up to 111. And from Philly, you get 0, 1, 50, 1, 1. So that's 53. And from Dei, you will get 500, 0, and 1. And all that adds up to 666, the literal meaning vicarious substitution or in place of fili means son and they means God. The excerpt below was taken from, uh, and now he mentions the website here, from Michael Scheifler's Bible Light Home page website. Quote, I have recently received what seems to be reliable information that a photo may exist of a papal funeral in St. Peter's Basilica near the beginning of the 20th century, in which the tiara inscribed with Vicarius Philidei can be seen. Combined with the above claims of our Sunday visitor, this would indicate that it was the funeral of either Leo XIII, who lived between 1878 and 1903, or reigned, sorry, reigned between 1878 and 1903, or Pius IX between 1903 and 1914, and that previous popes probably wore the tiara in question. If anyone can turn up this photo and make it available to me, I will post it in this article on the website. End quote. Eyewitness testimony claims that Pope Gregory XVI, between 1831 and uh, 1846, wore the inscribed tiara during the Easter Mass of 1845, and that the word vicarius was on, uh, on the top crown, Philly on the middle, and Dei on the lower crown. The word spelled out with jewels. The number of his name, see the index. 
Another note of interest is Vicarius Filii Dei is not the only title of the Pope that equal 666. So here comes an explanation of a few other words. I won't get into detail with that. You can look that up for yourself because we post the link to the website and the page that you can check that for yourself. But you have also uh, the title Dux Clary, Ludovicus, uh, Ludo, Ludovic, Ludo, yeah, Ludovics, uh, I Protera, and uh, in Latinos, in, in Greek, because in Greek you have the same system. And all these uh, four I just mentioned, uh, again, add up to 600, three score, and six. In Greek it was I Protera, uh, means tenth, uh, first of two, and Latinos, the Latin speaking man, in Greek. And in Greek you have, for example, Latinos, that's spelled L-A-T-E-I-N-O-S, and the equivalent numbers are 30, 1, 300, 5, 10, 50, 70, and 200. And that spells out to 666. Note, Latin is the official language of the Roman Catholic Church. Church documents are usually published first in Latin and then translated from Latin into other languages. I just read that already before. The association of Latinos with 666 was first suggested by Irenaeus. Uh, okay, we read that already, so he's just repeating himself. Then also Latinos has the number 666, and it is a very probable uh, solution, this being the name of the last kingdom of the fourth seven by Daniel, <coughs> of the fourth seen by Daniel. For the Latins are they who present their rule. I will not, however, make any boast over this coincidence. And then he puts the source. Then we have a few other names that the Pope is uh, entitled with. He Latina Basilea, the Latin Kingdom. Italica Ecclesia, the Italian Church. Apostates. In Hebrew, we have Romis, the Roman Kingdom, and Romiti, the Roman man. In Greek, then we have Titan, which is Satan. We have in Latin, Sancta Lux Dei, or the Holy Light of God. Rex Latinos sac uh, Sacerdos, the King of the Roman Priests. We have further Johannes Paulus Secundo, John Paul II. Um, and all these numbers, all these names that I just listed, you can look that up for yourself in the document that I'm reading here to you now, Always, when you indicate the letters of the alphabet, whether it's Greek or Hebrew or Roman, and you add the numbers up, you will always, always end up with 600, 3 score, and 6. The number of his name. Count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man. And his number is 666, Revelation 13, verses 17 to 18, as read in the beginning of this article. Tom, I'd uh, like to hear a little, uh, maybe even further explanation from you right now, and I have to take a short bathroom break for about a minute or two, okay? Yes, very well, and I'd be happy to do it. I mean, uh, this is a slam dunk. Nicholas has taken the official titles of the Pope, and there are many. Vicarious Filii Dei, or Vicar of Christ, it just being one of them. And in each of those titles, calculated by Roman numerals, by Greek numerals, and even by Hebrew numerals, those titles equal 666. Now, that exceeds the statistical probability that exists in the universe. If one could do the factorials, calculate the probability that every one of these titles in three languages equals 666 goes beyond comprehension. If you were to describe this in numbers, there would be the number one and then so many zeros behind it that you couldn't, you couldn't comprehend it. The statistical probability that every one of the many, many titles of the Pope 
could equal 666, not just in Roman numerals, but in Greek and Hebrew, is beyond comprehension. It can hardly be expressed even in numbers. And, but <clears throat> setting aside the fact, the demonstrable fact that the papacy fills this prophecy in spades, look at the, look at the plain language teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. They admit over and over and over that the official title, uh, the, the most recognized title of the papacy is Vicar of Christ. Just look up the word vicar in any, in any dictionary, and you will see the definition is replacement of. Now, take the prefix anti, A-N-T-I, and also look that up in the same dictionary. And it means replacement of. In other words, the word vicar and the prefix anti have one and the same meaning. Let me spell it out more clearly. Vicar of Christ literally means antichrist. They are universally interchangeable words. If you say vicar of Christ, you mean antichrist. And if you say antichrist, you mean vicar of Christ. That's a reality. Just look it up in any dictionary. For those who are motivated to do this, look it up for yourselves. Again, more proof that the papacy and only the papacy can fulfill this Bible prophecy regarding the number of his name. Also, look at the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Speaking of the Vicar of Christ in official Roman Catholic documents, bulls and encyclicals and pastoral letters, where he is, claims himself to be the Vicar of Christ, it also says the Pope is Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. He is not only the Vicar or the replacement of Christ, but he is Christ hidden under a veil of flesh. Now, when you put all that together, there, there's simply no room for debate or argument or speculation or equivocation. It's a slam dunk. God has made it so easy for us to positively identify who the Antichrist is in the Scripture that it's literally a marvel that the whole world doesn't know it. Just as easily as God made it to recognize who Jesus Christ is, the Savior of the world, the Lamb of God, God in history and the Bible made it equally easy to identify his nemesis, his counterfeit, the one who wars against him, the Antichrist. And I, and I know for people that have never heard this before, scratching their heads and saying, what is Tom trying to say? And somehow it just doesn't sink in. God did not want his people to miss who the, who the Christ is. And to say that God kept it a secret in the same Bible, kept it a secret as to the identity of Antichrist, the one who deceives the whole world, the one who soaks the earth with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, would that not be considered dealing treacherously with the same people that he came to die for? That he sent his son to rescue? Why would God make it so plain in the scriptures who the Messiah was, even predicting the very year that he would be baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist? Characterize his ministry and even quote verbatim what he would say on the cross, making it virtually impossible to miss who, the, who Jesus Christ really was. Why would the, he then make it difficult or confusing or leave a question 
as to who the counterfeit was who was going to deceive all of his people, the ones he died for. The assertion is untenable, but that's the teaching of the churches today. We don't know who the Antichrist is. We just know he's a future individual that comes at the end of time. When in fact, the Antichrist has been among us ever since the third century. The papacy rose in power as soon as the restrainer, the Caesars, abandoned their seat of power in Rome. What stood up in their place? The man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist, and the proofs are irrefutable. Incomprehensible, the statistical probability of every title of his name equaling 666 in Hebrew, in Greek, and Latin, and that he would in plain language tell the world that he is vicar of Christ, which literally means Antichrist just as the word universal and Roman Catholic are just two expressions of the same thing, Antichrist and Vicar of Christ are equally interchangeable words by dictionary definition. And even the very profession in the most authoritative writings of the papacy, the Roman Roman popes have described themselves not merely as the vicar or the replacement of Christ, but Christ himself hidden under a veil of flesh. Now, just as surely as we can read the Scriptures and proclaim Jesus to be the Christ and no one else, we can likewise use the Scriptures to point at the Pope as being the Antichrist, the counterfeit Christ. It's a slam dunk, and it's a no-brainer. I hate to be so plain about it, because, because the churches do everything they can to conceal these facts. But don't forget that all of these facts were known 500 years ago at the time of the Protestant Reformation. It's only our generation who have been made ignorant of these things. And we have to ask the question, how much now can we trust our pastors? Back to you, Yerk. Well, thank you very much for that explanation, Tom. But I, I, I missed a little bit, but I don't know if you mentioned that. When you translate the Greek word antichristo, uh, it can be translated in two different, or it can be understood in two different ways. Anti does not only mean against, but it also means in the place of. And that is exactly what Vicar of Christ stands for, in the place of. Yes, well, how greater can one oppose Christ than to say that he has replaced Christ? It's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer, Absolutely. And uh, I'm very thankful for your deep explanation that you gave just here. And uh, I will continue with um, characteristic number uh, 16, it is, I think, um, that the Antichrist will hate the Bible. Well, that's something new. Really? Does the Roman Catholic Church hate the Bible and anyone that uses it? Well, we can... uh, see by scripture. It probably is that way when we look at Mark chapter 4 verse 15. Quote, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. End quote. Um, as we all know, Satan hates the word of God because it exposes him perfectly. So naturally, the one Satan has doing his, uh, his bidding on her will hate, it, uh, will hate it just as much. Keep in mind, I did not write the history books, nor did I write the Bible. All this information is well documented and easy to research for yourselves. In fact, I implore you to do so. That's what I always did. I always said, do your own research. Never believe me. Don't believe Michael. Don't believe Tom. Do your own research, and you will come to the same conclusion. And if you cannot do your own research... 
come and ask us for the sources and we will provide them for you. That way you will know for a fact that the Roman Catholic Church really does speak in such a way when it comes to the Bible. Now notice a few comments of the Roman Catholic Church that even the babe in Christ can verify as of Satan. The decree set forth in the, in the year 1229 uh, AD by the Council of Valencia, that's in Spain, places the Bible on the index of forbidden books. The doctrine withholds it is forbidden for laymen, or the common man, to read the Old and New Testaments. We forbid them most severely to have the above books in the popular vernacular. The lords of the districts shall carefully seek out the heretics and dwellings, hovels and forests, and even the underground retreats shall be entirely wiped out. Council Tolosanum, Pope Gregory IX, Anno, uh, Anno Christi 1229. I'm sorry for some... Uh, noise here, that's probably just the cable, or fix the mic, is the audio still okay, this must be better now. Um, the Church Council of Tarragona, also in Spain, ruled that, quote, no one may possess the books of the Old and New Testaments in the Romans language, and if anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days after the promulgation of his decree, so they may be burned. That's from Histoire de la Bible en France, uh, 1910, page 14, or History of the Bible in France, 1910. Quote, Socialism, Communism, clandestine societies, Bible societies, pests of this sort must be destroyed by all means, end quote. That's from the encyclical Quanta Cura issued by Pope Pius IX, December 6th, 1866. Oh dear Lord, December 6, 1866. Even the 666 is in that day. The Bible does not pretend to be a formulary of belief as in a creed of catechism. There is nowhere in the New Testament a clear methodic, methodical statement of the teaching of Christ. That's from Question Book, page 66. Um, continue. It was well for Luther that he did not come into the world until a century after the immortal invention of Gutenberg. A hundred years earlier, his idea of directing 250 million men to read the Bible would have been received with uh, shouts of laughter and would inevitably have caused his removal from the pulpit of Wittenberg to a hospital for the insane. That's a quote from The Face of Our Fathers, page 69. And also see In the Face of Millions, page 152. Another quote. Again, it has ever been practically impossible for men, generally, to find out Christ from the Bible only. End quote. Question box, page 17. I will leave um, the sources now, but just quoting. Quote. The Bible nowhere implies that it is the only source of faith. End quote. Quote, the scriptures indeed is a divine book, but it is a dead letter, which has to be explained and cannot exercise the action which the preacher can obtain. End quote. And another quote, a dead and speechless book. End quote. Quote, the simple fact is the, that the Bible, like all dead letters, call for a living interpreter. End quote. And the last quote, the Bible was not intended to be a textbook of Christian religion. End quote. Notice, they speak of those that trust the Bible as heretics. Were you aware that on March 12, 2000, the Pope called all non-Catholics heretics in his mea culpa? It is hard to see why such hatred is displayed towards Is it hard to see why such hatred is displayed towards the Bible? Only those threatened by its truths will hate it, for it is plainly written in Galatians chapter 4, verse 16, quote, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? End quote. Well, like I always cite on the internet, truth is the new hate speech, and uh, you will see a lot of that in the future. 
it doesn't take much sense to see why Rome would hate the Bible. It exposes them to be the home of Antichrist. This is the only reason they feel this way about it. This is the only reason 86.2% of Catholic doctrine cannot be found in the Bible. This explains why they claim tradition to be on equal footing with the Bible. The Bible is an open and graphic threat to all that is Rome, and that it is, one, uh, it is the one and only reason uh, they attack those that hold the Bible dear to their hearts. Rome made many claims in those quotes regarding the word, everything from calling it a dead letter to claiming it is not a textbook for a Christian faith. I believe the following verses prove that the Catholic Church is telling bold faced lies. The Bible declares it teaches all necessary things which Jesus did in Acts 1, uh, 1 to 2. Um, this, uh, the Bible declares it teaches certainty of his action and teaching. Uh, the Bible declares it, uh, it teaches life in the name of Jesus, instructions to salvation, commands of the Lord, the proper conduct, every good work, protection against sin, an assurance of eternal life, standard by which teachers are tested, standard which we cannot go beyond, blessings from God, joy that is complete, standard of judgment. To put it bluntly, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, quote, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints that marrow, and is discerner for the thoughts and intents of the heart. End quote. I have many more quotes regarding this topic, proving Rome hates the Bible with a passion on my Word as a Beast in the index page on the site in the warning section of the menu. So this completes um, characteristic number 16, and I just want to add uh, a tip of a video that you should watch how the Roman Catholics, and especially the Jesuits, try to change the Bible, change the Word of God, when you watch a lecture from Walter Feit that is called Battle of the Bibles. Just um, type that in on YouTube in the search engine there, and um, the video will pop up for you. It's about, I think, uh, two hours long. And there you will really see where the King James Bible that we take as basis on our teachings or our readings here on the broadcast, how that has been uh, falsified. If you ever have the choice to read the King James original version from 1611 or the new King James that is even promoted by Walter Feit nowadays. And don't forget, Walter Feit works for Amazing Discoveries. And Amazing Discoveries, that is his prime uh, source of income, and that is his prime source that he works for, is a 501c3 organization. You can find that on their website. So don't take my words for it. Research it for yourself. But Walter Feit made this video, Battle of the Bibles, and he very much explains how the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits have corrupted the Bible. So when you take any other Bible than the 1611 KGV, you will be misled by reading the Bible. Words are taken out, whole phrases are taken out, even whole chapters are taken out. And uh, when you continue to, uh, want to continue the study, there are two more videos that he made, and these are called Changing the Words, or Changing the Word. I don't know, just type it in in YouTube, and you will find uh, two videos popping up uh, an hour and a half long, each one of those. So, it is not only important to read the Bible when you want to understand God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, but it also is imperative, absolutely imperative, that you seek the right Bible. Now, I have here in Belgium a lot of discussion with unbelievers who always say, well, the Bible was written by man, and I tell them, well, the Bible was written by man, but it was inspired, or they were inspired by the Holy Spirit. And, of course, they don't take my word for it. They just laugh at me. But that's the point. The Bible was written by men, but by men who have received the Holy Ghost and have received, actually, the Word of God and wrote it down. And the only 
English Bible that we can hold in our hands right now, and we are very lucky that they haven't taken it down on the Internet right now. You can get the 1611 KGV on, uh, on the Internet if you want to. And um, the link for that is um, ad1611.com. Just type that in into your browser and you will get to that Bible. And there you can read the whole King James Bible online. And you can still, of course, buy it, I guess, over in the United States, even in some bookshops, but you can buy it online. And I absolutely advise you, don't take any other Bible than the King James Bible. That is also the reason why a lot of preachers and seminaries and have not today always try to discredit the 1611 King James Bible. And they say King James was a Romanist and King James was a, uh, was a sodomist and King James was a pedophile and I don't know what. Everything they do, they try to discredit the Holy Word of God written down in the 1611 AD King James Version Bible. Tom, turn to you. Yes, well, I have much to add to it. First of all, I disagree with Nicholas. Uh, I very rarely disagree with Nicholas uh, in, in his assessment of Walter Weiff. Uh It is true that that church, uh, the amazing discoveries, that's that that from me, but it's not from Nicholas. Oh, that that's from right. me. Amazing, amazing discoveries, and I looked it up on that page, are a 501c3 organization. Yeah, well, I don't condone a fi uh, any church of Jesus Christ accepting a 501c3, a tax-exempt status, because that simply gives the government rule over the church, and the, and the beast should never have rule over God's house. And uh, why uh, Walter Byth or Amazing Discoveries has accepted a 501c3 is inexplicable to me. But the purpose of the 501c3 was to limit or to put a threat of liability against those churches if they depart and delve into areas of politics and begin to war with the state. And then the government has the threat of assessing back taxes and literally financially destroying that church. The, the whole idea of a 501c3 was just to get control of the churches. But I've seen Walter Weiss' videos, and uh, he leads the attack against the beast. And uh, so our, 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 our perceptions of Walter Weiss may differ, and uh, I'll just let it go at that. But... The truth of the matter is, the papacy does hate the Bible. First of all, the papacy arrogated to itself the sole uh, responsibility of canonizing the scriptures. And when they canonized the scriptures at one of the earliest councils of the Roman Catholic Church back in the days of Constantine, they included Gnostic books. They were not genuine uh, books of the Bible. They were spurious at best. And the, the Roman Catholic Bible to this day has many more chapters and books than does the King James Bible, which has 66 books. The Roman Catholic Church, early in its existence, included books that Jesus, nor the apostles, nor any of the saints ever made reference to. We have to know that they're spurious, that they are uh, adding to the Word of God and detracting from the Word of God in, in like manner. So that is the best expression of hatred for God's Word, to add to it or to take away from it. The Jews were always forbidden to add even a jot or a tittle to God's Word and to not take away a jot or a tittle from God's Word. Look, if you take that which is perfect and modify it in any way, you've destroyed it. And that prohibition came down from God Almighty. Do not add to my word and take nothing away from it. The Roman Catholic Church has done both, historically, from its very inception in creating the Roman Catholic Bible and canonizing what should be included, what should not be included in the Bible. The best reference for what should be included in the Bible are references made in the Bible to specific books. 
And uh, Rome destroyed that at the very inception of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, later the Roman Catholic Church insisted that the Bible should be only in Latin, a dead language that only was known by the priests. You had to go to college to learn Latin. It, had, it was a dead language. And, of course, the Roman Catholic priests were trained in Latin. So, therefore, they were the only ones who could read and expound upon the Scriptures, the Roman Catholic priests. The Bible was unknown among the laity of the Roman Catholic Church. First of all, they were forbidden by Roman Catholic canon law to possess the Scriptures. And if they were given permission by the priest or the bishop to have them possess the Scriptures, they had to be in Latin. And then it could only be understood according to the official teaching of the magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church. In other words, you could not believe or teach anything other than what the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church was. So even if you had a Bible in Latin and read it for yourself and understood it and found that it contradicted the, the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, you had to dissent to the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. That is an expression of hatred for God's Word. Then, the Roman Catholic Church began to burn Bibles that were in the possession of the laity. They made it a law that anybody unauthorized who had a copy of the Scriptures must turn it in by a certain period of time or be prosecuted by the church. And so everyone was instructed to bring their Bibles to the city square, and they had a big bonfire burn all the Bibles, thus making the Bible go back to the sole domain of the priests. When that was unsuccessful, and it was still found that people possessed the Scriptures, as corrupt as they were, Rome finding failure in her ability to burn all the Bibles, began to burn those who read those Bibles. So not only were they burning Bibles, they were burning those who read it. History is dripping with the blood of people who defied the Roman Catholic Church's uh, monopoly on the Scriptures. Then they began to corrupt the Bible. Since they couldn't burn all the people that read it. They couldn't burn all the Bibles. They began to publish Bibles of their own. And I was reading in, a, in, a, in one of the most recent readings I did, uh, Vicars of Christ, the Dark Side of the Papacy, a Jesuit priest by the name of Peter DeRosa expounds the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church, and one of the most significant uh, portions, I believe it was Pope Clement VI. I want to say Pope, or rather Antichrist, Clement VI, so detested the Bible that he rewrote it, completely rewrote it, according to his understanding. And when it was published, uh, it was discovered both by Protestants and Roman Catholics. The hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church read it and saw that it was such a clumsy ridiculous translation of the Bible that it even embarrassed the Roman Catholic Church. And I can't remember if the book said they killed that pope or he died naturally shortly after the publication of that book. But that book was, 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 uh, fell into the hands of Protestants. It was widespread. It was sold all over Europe. And the Protestants got a hold of it and made an example of just how much the papacy hated God's word by corrupting it in such a clumsy and ridiculous manner. And it so embarrassed the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church that immediately upon the death of this pope, whether he was killed, I don't remember, or whether he died of natural causes, but shortly after its publication, the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church went about secretly through the bishops and the priests to gather up all these Bibles and burn them, because it was an embarrassment to the Roman Catholic Church. It even embarrassed the, the, the priests. 
and uh, uh, and unable to do that, the Protestants, you know, it was a, it was a gold mine for Protestants that they could take this Roman Catholic Bible and compare it with the Word of God, and 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 emphasize the fact of the hatred uh, that the papacy has for God's holy Word. When all of Rome's attempts up to that point to stop the reading of the Scriptures failed, they began more and more to corrupt the Bibles. And now today, the market is flooded with every permutation of error there can possibly be. And to find the true Word of God in any Bible bookstore today is, is like finding a needle in a haystack. It's the authorized King James of the, uh, the, the, the King James Bible. And God has kept his word. He has preserved his word. And the Bible for English-speaking people is the King James Version of the Bible. And when you compare side-by-side the scriptures from the King James Bible and any one of these other erroneous Bibles, you begin to see a pattern. They are destroying the divinity of Christ they are reducing him to just a prophet or a teacher. And they have obliterated the efficacy of Christ's blood, whereby we are saved. It, they literally preach another Christ. And the changes are subtle. The changes are hardly noticeable until you take the King James Bible and compare it word for word with any of these new Bibles make a record of all of those changes, and find out what they leave out. Find out what these new Bibles leave out. Find out what they add, and you'll come to no other conclusion but that they are wrecking the history of Jesus Christ in the Bible, the the Messiah. And the whole purpose of it is, is to present, at the end of time, another Christ in this phony futurist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy, Daniel, particularly Daniel 9.27. It's all a preparation to deny Christ in his first coming and who Jesus was, and to propose to the world an alternate Christ at the end of time. It all works together with futurism. And I recommend uh, 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 a uh, very scholarly Uh, analysis, comparison between the King James Bible and all these other translations in a work by a woman by the name of Gail Ripplinger and Perverted Bible Bible Versions is her book. And you, for those who don't like to read and, you know, America just doesn't like to read. So it's almost useless for me to recommend books for people to read anymore because I know they won't read them. But The visual side-by-side comparison of the King James Bible and all these other Bible perversions is in video form now. All you have to do is go to YouTube and and, and type in the search engine, uh, Gail Ripplinger, that's G-A-I-L, common spelling for Gail, Ripplinger, R-I-P-L-I-N-G-E-R. Ripplinger, just like it sounds, Gail Ripplinger. And watch her video. It's about two hours. And, of course, uh, if you you want the truth in sound bites, you just want to spend only five minutes investigating this, I'm afraid you'll be disappointed. She's a very thorough analyst of these perverted Bibles. And she will show you in black and white, in overhead projections, the comparison between the King James Bible and and the the most popular altered versions of the Bible available today. And you'll discover that those are the Bibles that are available in the books, in the bookstores, and the King James Bible has to be specially ordered. And then you have to be careful that it, that it hasn't been altered. Does the papacy hate the Bible? Absolutely. It defines the entire history of the Vatican. It, it, it defines the entire history of the papacy. The papacy has been at war With the Bible and those who read it, from its very inception, it continues today, and that war against the Bible is just as vigorous today as it ever was. And they've accomplished 
the perversion of the Bible so thoroughly that it's hard to find people that really know the truth because they don't have the Bible in their possession. They don't know what the Word of God is and what it says. And uh, uh, this deception, this attack on the Bible, is going to continue until Christ returns. God's plainly said, when I return, shall I find faith on the earth? That's a question. Shall I find faith on the earth? And why will, it be, why will faith be so rare when Christ returns? Because they've obliterated the Bible. They've perverted it in every possible way. And, uh, you know, uh, people used to ask me all the time, Tom, what is the right Bible to read? I was able to impress upon people that there is very impo- it's a very important matter to determine which Bible you read. And they had to ask me, Tom, what is the Bible that we should read? The answer is simple, the one that's most criticized. And what is that? Hands down, no argument, it's the King James Bible. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. And uh, the proof of the hatred of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church uh, for the Bible is legion. It defines the Roman Catholic Church from beginning to end. And uh, that's my small contribution to what Nicholas has said. Okay, thank you very much. And I just have to add one other point. Because all here on this broadcast uh, involved right now, listening in the room, and maybe um, uh, most of the people who will uh, listen to this broadcast later on or download it are native English-speaking people. The problem is that we have a few more languages than just English all over the world. And I, for my part, could read the Bible in Dutch and, of course, in my native language, which is German. And I tried to get a hold on a Lutheran Bible that has not been corrupted. And I did not find anywhere a Lutheran Bible in the original text of uh, 1534, I think it is, for the first time that he published that. Uh, and uh, 1545 is another publishment. This is including the, including the Old Testament. It is, to me at least, impossible to find a correct Bible in my native language. So that's why I turn to English. But English has, for me, the problem that... Uh, it's not my native language, so I don't understand every word. And uh, sometimes even these words from the Bible can't be translated into a way that I understand it correctly. So I have to fight with that too. But uh, my first reference also is the English 1611 um, authorized version of the King James Bible, even though that it has to me the flaws that I don't understand at all because it is not my native language. So... Um, at least in English, the Bible is preserved that way. But uh, to find it in your language, if you're not a native English speaker, um, I think that is something else. And uh, I read through my Lutheran Bible. Uh, this is called the Lutheran Bible from 1984. Strange that they just used that year. Um, but when I compared it to my uh, King James Bible that I have also, and I read the same text, I see missings in words uh, and and, and turning around words that mean something else in English than they mean in the German translation. So I know that uh, the most of the Lutheran Bibles that you can get in bookshops today, online bookshops at least, are also perverted Bibles. (coughs) Okay. Um, we have um, then the next point on the agenda that will be uh, number 17. Um, The Antichrist has a church that makes war with the saints. So we are just getting even deeper into the same subject that we have just been. Um, Because that he makes war with the saints, we already covered that a little bit, but we will go deeper into this and now Characteristics of the Antichrist number 17. Start with a quote from the prophet Daniel. 
chapter 7, verse 25, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High, end quote. And Revelation 13, uh, verse 7, adds to this, quote, and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, end quote. Rome has all along never denied it persecuted Christians. Sure, they will call them heretics. But when you look into what these heretics believed, they were actually Bible-believing Christians. History is literally drenched with all sorts of evidence proving this out nicely. Jesus said in John 16, verse 2, quote, They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yeah, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think, that he doeth God's service, end quote. Were you aware that in the Pope's globally broadcast mea culpa, we mentioned that already a few times before, that he admitted the Catholic Church killed millions upon millions because they thought they were doing God's will? Jesus said that they will kick you out of churches and kill you thinking they are doing God's will. And then the Pope says they kicked people out of churches and then had to kill them because they thought they were doing God's will. Strange thing is, the whole world missed that. All I saw after that mea culpa on March 12, 2000, was the media and all the world talking about how holy the Pope was for asking for forgiveness. Don't get me wrong. I do forgive the Pope as well as all the Popes, cardinals, bishops, priests, monks, and governing officials under the rule of Rome that did those things. If I don't forgive, I am no more a Christian than Satan himself. But forgiving him doesn't change history. I have forgiven and forgotten as I am instructed to do as a Christian. But I am also painfully aware that my Bible has these prophecies in it. They are here for a reason. We are told in advance what the Pope will do simply because we are called to warn the people. So, yes, I forgive him and all his cohorts, but the word of God is plain. It warns us he isn't done yet. So we must study the prophecies of old so as to better understand the characters of this Antichrist we find ourselves engaging in these last days. As usual, I'm not going to ask you to take my word for it when it comes to prophecy being fulfilled. So, does history confirm the Popes of Rome as being the ones that have killed Christians in mass numbers? Now we will follow a few quotes. The first comes from a brief Bible reading, page 16. Quote, For teaching faith contrary to the teaching of the Church of Rome, history records the martyrdom of more than a hundred million people. End quote. The second is coming from the New Catholic Encyclopedia, Inquisition, Auto da Fe, and Massacre of St. Uh, Bartholomew's Day. Quote, Under the influence of Germanic customs and concepts, torture was little used from the 9th to the 12th centuries. But with the revival of Roman law, the practice was re-established in the 12th century. In 1252, Pope Innocent IV, what a name for a pope, eh? sanctioned the infliction of torture by the civil authorities upon heretics, and torture came to have to recognize, a recognized place in the procedure of inquisitional courts. And there's a next quote coming from a sermon by the Catholic priest D.S. Phelan on Sunday, December 12, 1909, published in the Roman Catholic St. Louis period Deco, um, the Western Watchman, December 16, 1909. Quote, During the 2,000 years the Roman Catholic Church has been on this earth, she has warred with nearly every government in this world. The world is full of their ruins. Their thrones have toppled over and fallen, their dynasties have come to dust. And the governments of the world today will meet the same fate if they challenge the hostility of the Church of God. She remains, she is today what she was 2,000 years ago. She is today what she was during the Middle Ages. She is today what she was during the times of Protestant persecution during and since the 16th century. She is the invincible Church of God. God help the state that attacks her. God help the king that provokes her hostility. End quote. 
The next quote comes from The Lawfulness of Persecution in the Ramla Force of June 19, uh, 1849, pages 119 and 126. And that was an English Roman Catholic journal published from 1848 to 1862. Quote, The Catholic <clears throat> the Catholic has some reason on his side when he calls for the temporal punishment of heretics, for he claims the true title of Christian for himself exclusively and professes to be taught by the never-failing presence of the Spirit of God. It is no more, quote, morally, unquote, wrong to put a man to death for heresy than for murder. And, in many cases, persecution for religious opinions is not only permissible, but highly advisable and necessary. End quote. Now follows a longer quote from T. R. Burks from The Four Prophetic Empires, 1845, pages 248 to 249. Quote. Under these bloody maxims, Roman Catholic decrees to kill Protestants, those persecutions were carried on. After the signal of open martyrdom had been given in the canons of Orléans, and followed the extirpation of the French Albigenses under the form of a crusade, the establishment of the Inquisition, the cruel attempts to extinguish the Swiss Waldenses, the martyrdoms of the English Lollards, the cruel wars to exterminate the Bohemians, the burning of Huss and Jerome, and multitudes of other confessors before the Reformation and afterwards, the ferocious cruelties practiced in the Netherlands, the martyrdom of Queen Mary's reign, the extinction, uh, extinction by fire and sword of the Reformation in Spain and Italy, by freed and open persecution in Poland, the massacre of Bartholomew, the perjuries on the French Huguenots by the Catholic League, and all the cruelties and perjuries connected with the revocation of the Edict uh, of Nantes in France. These are the more open and conspicuous facts which explain the prophecy of Daniel 7, besides the slow and secret murders of the Holy Tribunal of the Inquisition, which is yeah, the office of the Inquisition that time, end quote. And the short quote from the Encyclio Quanta Cura issued by Pope Pius IX on December 6, 1866, in the date Socialism, communism, clandestine societies, Bible societies, pests of these sort must be destroyed by all means. End quote. Some of the totals <clears throat> were not completely accurate in those quotes, and, uh, as it was rather difficult to investigate and find each and every person Rome killed. Fact is, all of the totals were rather small in comparison to the actual amount. If you seek a more accurate account, I suggest a book. Fox's Book of Martyrs, that can be found on the index on the site, uh, Remnant of God Dalmor. This book has a far greater list of facts on this because this was the whole reason for the writing of the book. John Fox put it together to expose Roman Catholicism. No one put more research together on this prophetic event than John Fox himself, and he calculates the number to be in the range of five hundred million killed over the years by Rome. Of course, no one can be 100% accurate, especially since many of the killings were done in secret dungeons, and many of the records have been destroyed by Rome as to hide the truth. Plus, how do you record three complete nations that were completely wiped out in the infancy of Roman Catholicism? Of course, I speak of the Vandals, Herulis, and the Ostrogoths, no one really knows how many million were wiped out here because Rome all but completely wiped out these races of people. There aren't any descendants alive today to uh, even give any incline as to, how, as to just how many have been killed by the Vatican. Many think that the Pope's mea culpa of March 12, 2000 was evidence that Rome has changed. They believe that the Catholic Church won't be killing again. Yet, the very same Pope that supposedly asked forgiveness for killing over 500 million Christians is the same Pope that reinstituted the Office of Inquisition. The Holy Office still exists. 
Pope John Paul II revives the Inquisition. This is taken by, uh, from uh, Kathleen R. Hayes, February 1991, in the NRI Trumpet, page number three. Quote, The thought of a revived holy office of the Inquisition would pacify some and offend others. Nevertheless, the holy office still exists. Only its name has been changed. Pope John Paul II has been, uh, has been instrumental in its revival. One may argue that this Ratzinger-run agency is merely an attempt by the Catholic Church to root out communism or backslidden priests and their practices. However, with John Paul II's objective to implement God's mandate by creating a global church state, which will administer from traditional Roman Catholic theology is enough cause for alarm. Malachi Martin has already stated in his book, The Keys of This Blood, that the Pope will not tolerate any belief system that opposes his, not on a civil or church level. In John Paul II, the world will behold a tyrant who will coldly execute direct orders against those whom he claims are heretics or immoral. Moreover, like his papal predecessor, John Paul II will carry out his godly mandate in the name of Christ, or perhaps Mary. May God help us all. End quote. Why is he apologizing? Tom, you want to fill in something? No, go, go, quiet. go ahead. Okay. Why is he apologizing in March of 2000 when all along he reopened the office of Inquisition that saw millions die at their hands. Because they plan to start killing again. Prophecy cannot lie. The word of God said the mortal wound would be healed, and this beast would come back in full force once again, and so it will. One can easily see this beast snarling in how, how it bloodily proclaims its agenda without fear of reprisal. Now follows a quote from the Western Watchman, December 24, 1908. Quote, The Catholic Church has persecuted. When she thinks it is good to use the physical force, she will use it. Will the Catholic Church give bond that she will not persecute? The Catholic Church gives no bonds for her, quote, good behavior, unquote. End of quote. That's right. Just as Jesus said in John 16, verse 2, they actually think the killings and torture is good behavior that pleases God the Father. But look at verse 3 of John chapter 16. Jesus himself says, quote, These things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father, nor me. End quote. On March 12, 2000, John Paul II admits, admitted the Roman Catholic Church does not know the Father or Jesus. To deny that is to deny the very words of Jesus Christ. This church really is, quote, drunken with the blood of the saints, unquote, as Revelation 17, verse 6 puts it. Still, some will say this is the modern day. This cannot happen now. We are civilized. That was hundreds of years ago. Are you aware the Vatican is right now in court dealing with all that it was doing in the Nazi prison camps? Are you aware that they are being, used, uh, are being sued as we speak? I have all the facts on my Vatican war crimes page that you can look up in the index on the website of remnantofgod.org. Uh, remnant Here's only one small article from that page. Quote, they are all together. That comes from uh, 3rd of April 2000, Time Magazine, page 38. Quote, an interview with Bill Dorick, one of the plaintiffs in class action suit against Vatican, posted on 21st of January 2000 in www.emperorsclothes.com uh, or www.pnc.net. Jared. This lawsuit initially involved Ukrainian plaintiffs, but now it involves people killed by the Ustashi fascists in Yugoslavia as well? Bill, right. 
The Ustashi movement was marked by its, cler uh, by its clerical fascist character. It was controlled by the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. The Ustashi killed Ukrainians first, but they killed people in Yugoslavia too, especially at the Croatian Ustashi death camp, Jozo Novak. Jared, a lot of people don't realize that the Catholic Church was involved in this stuff. The replies, up to its eyeballs. Priests were directly involved in the mass murders. We want people, <clears throat> we want people whose families were taken to Jasenovac and never returned. We want evidence of people being killed. We want any document, photographs, testimonies. There's a lot of material out there that we know people have. The Serbs have never brought it forward. The Serbs always said, well, God knows what happened, so we don't have to parade this material around to show people evidence. Well, yes, you do, and that's been probably the biggest mistake the Serbs made in the last 55 years. We haven't made clear to the people what really happened. Jared, so you were saying the lawsuit started with the Ukraine. Bill, right. The deposition started, and a Serb named Peter Makara started working with the attorneys, Easton and Levi and gave them various names of people whose families were victims, mine included. And they asked me to be a plaintiff. The attorneys have filed an amount, uh, an, an amount that complained, and they have named three of us. The Jason Novak Foundation in Birmingham, Mich Michigan is involved. It's an organization to bring, public, to bring public attention to what we call the hidden holocaust. It is not an unknown holocaust. It is quite well known by scholars around the world. It is just that nobody wanted to come forward and talk about the victimization of the Serbs in the Balkans. Barry Liturgy from the Foundation is looking for a Roman plaintiff to join the suit as well. We need people to come forward who have evidence to offer, particularly pictures, documents, and first-person testimonies. There still are some survivors out there, and of course, family members and people killed of Jezenovac. And don't forget the Ustashi killed people throughout Serbia and Bosnia, as well as Ukraine. Jezenovac was a trial balloon on how to effectively slaughter large numbers of people. It was controlled by this clerical fascist regime in Croatia, under the control of the Catholic Church. Jezenovac was the first death camp the test case. The Nazis wanted to see how many people it was possible to kill and how much time, the organizational problems and so on. This was before Auschwitz and the others. They didn't have the gas chambers as Jasenovac, so what, uh, what they did was bludgeon people to death or disembowel or dismember them. I didn't take, it didn't take any bullets. They needed bullets to fight the war. They had contests at Jasenovac every night to see who could kill the most in one night. One particular priest won by killing 1,500 Serbs in an evening. This is all documented. Chair, oh my God. And Bill continues. And since there were over six or 700,000 people who were killed, there should be a bunch of people out there like me. My relatives were all killed. Chair, my relatives were killed in Lithuania and in Poland, in Lodz. Bill, they are all together in common graves. The Jews, the Romans, the Serbs, the Ukrainians, all together. Uh, the Roma, sorry. The Serbs and the Ukrainians, all together. It is outrageous that the world does not know about this and about the terrible role the Vatican played both in leading the fascist Eustachy and in hoarding this money and later in making sure the killers got away. The Vatican set up the actual escape routes for the Ustashi. These murderers, who were also Roman Catholic priests, fled to Argentina, Canada, and the United States after the war with false passports prepared from inside the Vatican red line. This is all documented in the book Unholy Trinity by Aarons and Loftus. End quote. Many that hate me means Nicholas from Remen of God Lord. Many that hate me and my ministry proclaimed that page of fact a farce. But when I got permission to put the lawyer's phone number, addresses, and email addresses on the page, they have not since commented. 
That page also has a rather extensive list of links on the same topic as well. One more thing before moving on to the next prophecy. Were you aware that just last year the EWTN Roman Catholic Television Network website hosted a conversation on their board that spoke of all the positive benefits of burning heretics at the stake? I have all the posts before EWTN deleted them on my Evils of EWTN page on the website. It's shocking to read, so I advise you all to look that up. Were you aware that John Paul II called all non-Catholics heretics in his globally broadcast of Mea Culpa of March 12, 2000? Were you also aware there are many nations the world over where Roman Catholicism is a large part of the laws of the land? Kind of makes this next quote more gruesome then, doesn't it? We have follows the quote from Jos uh, Josiah Strong from Our Country, chapter 5, uh, parts 2 to 4. To quote, the Archbishop of St. Louis said, quote, heresy and unbelief are crimes, and in Christian countries, as in Italy and Spain, for instance, where all people are Catholics, and where the Catholic religion is an essential part of the law of the land, they are punished as crimes, end quote. Every cardinal, bishop, and bishop of the Catholic Church takes an oath of allegiance to the Pope, in which occur the following words, quote, heretic, schismatics, and rebels to our, uh, to our said Lord, the Pope, for his aforesaid successors, I will to my utmost persecute and oppose, end quote. Experience teaches that there is no other remedy for the evil but to put the heretics or Protestants to death. For the Romish Church proceeded gradually. I'm sorry, I just interrupted you a little bit. Is uh, something with my audio? It's cleared up now, Yerk. Continue. I hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, I'm going to continue this last paragraph again. This is from Cardinal Bellarmine, famous champion of Romanism, cited by uh, Schumacher. Uh, page 76, quote, Experience teaches that there is no other remedy for the evil but to put heretics or Protestants to death. For the Romish Church proceeded gradually and tried every remedy. At first she merely excommunicated them. Afterwards she added the fine. Then she banished them. And finally she was constrained to put them to death. End quote. With the One World Church, one world government, one world court, and one world currency in the Pope's control, do you think Rome will have trouble making her satanic dogma into the laws of the land as well? Have you seen my Roman Catholic IRS uh, page yet? According to prophecy, Rome will do as she desires. Can we stop it? No. All we can do is get ourselves ready to meet Jesus. For signs like this prove beyond the shadow of a doubt, he is indeed coming very soon. This finishes uh, characteristic number 17. Um, all I have to add to this when, you, uh, when you're just reading here, have you seen my Roman Catholic IRS index page? Uh, well, when he mentions the IRS here, Nicholas, that is, uh, it reminds me um, that we should maybe mention Karen Hudis, who was a very high-level attorney within the World Bank and has become a whistleblower. And she states that 60% of the income tax paid by the American people today are going directly to the Jesuit order. My excuses for if there was any problem with the sound, I had no problem here, but uh, I don't hear myself, of course, so... Sorry for that, and uh, Tom, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this quite long citation that I just read. Yes, it's, it's a lengthy discussion, and, 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 and uh, what is the most discouraging about it? Uh, persecution of the saints is one of the most defining characteristics of the Antichrist Church of Rome, and people are almost clueless. I mean, they've heard of the Inquisition, 
but they say that's a thing of the long distant past and that the Inquisition only claimed 50,000 or rather 50 million people and that it ended in 1865 in Spain. The Inquisition no longer exists according to the deceived. But Joseph Ratzinger was the prefect for the Holy Roman Inquisition. It's now called the Congregation for the Preservation of the Doctrine of the Faith. They've just changed its name. And that's all it takes for people to have forgotten about the Inquisitions. Look, the Third and Fourth Lateran Council of the Roman Catholic Church, about the, at the turn of the first millennium, the Third and Fourth Lateran Councils determined who was a heretic. And that it was not only not a sin to kill a heretic, it was a meritorious work. In other words, grace could be infused into the Roman Catholic soul that killed a heretic. And that's why the killing of the saints, which Rome has always called heretics, killings of the saints is a meritorious work. And, uh, you know, Rome won't admit it, but it's one of the sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church to shed the blood of heretics. And uh, the very oath of the Jesuits demands the shedding of the blood of heretics and Protestants and liberals. So does the oath of the Knights of Columbus, or the Knights of Malta. And it's still the law of the church. Now, in Peter DeRosa's book, Vickers of Christ, the Dark Side of the Papacy, he admits that the Inquisition was instituted by the popes, I believe it was Innocent III, uh, uh, as a result of these, of these councils. Rome has made it a matter of canon law that still exists today. And for 605 consecutive years, and the terms of 83 consecutive popes, Rome perfected the Inquisition and wielded it all throughout Christendom. And literally, the, the, the lives that were claimed by the Inquisition are, have never been rightly calculated. I mean, they, they admit that, that the Spanish Inquisition claimed 50 million, but uh, it's, look, let me dispel something. They've made it appear that the Spanish Inquisition, when it closed in, in the middle part of the 1800s, put an end to the Inquisition. But really all that marks is the transition from uh, the Inquisitions as it existed at that time, a visible tribunal of Roman Catholic priests uh, interrogating, torturing, and then killing uh, "Quote unquote heretics." It just went. It just took on a completely different form. The Inquisitions now are conducted in the form of world wars. And this article that you're reading of these words that Nicholas has included in this may mention the persecution of the Orthodox Serbs by the Roman Catholic Church, by led by the Franciscan priests of the former Yugoslavia. And they, they exiled a third of the Orthodox Serbs. They forcibly converted a third of the Orthodox Serbs to Roman Catholicism, and they butchered a third. And the butchery of the Franciscans, the priests of the Roman Catholic Church, was so heinous, so brutal, that it even stunned or marveled the, the, the Nazi hierarchy. They just had to turn their backs and walk away when they saw what the Roman Catholic Church was doing to those Orthodox Serbs. And one of them, you know, like I say before, I could, I could, uh, Nicholas offered uh, the title of some books by Loftus, 
I highly recommend people to read, but Americans don't read. So they, 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 they're glad to take their information in video form. So I'll just give them a glimpse. Go to YouTube or any other good video source, and in the search engine, just type in Jay Settleback. This is the concentration camp that Yerk was reading about. Uh, my pronunciation is a little bit different than his because of the, the, uh, the uh, accent. But it is, spe- it is spelled J-A-S-O-N, Jason, O-V-A-C, Jay Senelback. And watch the, watch the video. Watch the video. And remember that this was 1943. This was 1943. Not so long ago. Just before I was born. The Roman Catholic Church led the bloodiest crusade against the Orthodox Serbs regarded as heretics by the Roman Catholic Church. Remember, it was the Orthodox Church that in 1054 separated from Rome in protest against the papacy, much like the Protestants did. They did it at the turn of the millennium, and Rome has tried to annihilate them ever since. They'll either come back to the Roman Catholic Church and submit to the supreme divine right authority of the Pope, or they're going to be eliminated. And the same goes for Protestants today. And if you want to see what Rome does to the heretics, just go type in the word in YouTube, Jay Senelbeck, and watch that video. I'll, I'll give you just one brief synopsis. There was a man, an Orthodox Serb, that was butchered by the Franciscan priest, the Eustachi, the Catholic action in the former Yugoslavia. They butchered uh, an Orthodox Serb. And then they took his wife and children prisoners and starved them, kept them in, in confinement and denied them any food or drink for over a week. And then finally, in a, in a, in a pretended act of, of, uh, of contrition, they brought into the cell this woman and these children a roast, a large roast, and water to drink. And, of course, they voraciously uh, devoured the roast. And it wasn't until they finished that the... Uh, the uh, the perpetrators told her that they'd just eaten their own their own husband and father. That is the cruelty, the historic cruelty, of the inquisitor of God's people, the papacy. Six hundred and five years, eighty three consecutive popes, and when it was seemingly done away with, it simply took the form of world wars. And when Avril Manhattan, in his book, Terror Over Yugoslavia, related all of these atrocities, which you'll see in the video, Jay Senevac, when he, when, when he exposed the heinous, diabolical butcher of non-Roman Catholics in the former Yugoslavia, he concluded his book by saying this, What the Roman Catholic Church did in the former Yugoslavia in in, in the endeavor to create a a Roman Catholic superstate in Croatia, which used to be part of Yugoslavia, the whole purpose of the persecution was to create a Roman Catholic state of Croatia. He said the very thing that the Vatican did to create Croatia in the former Yugoslavia, the slaughter of the Orthodox Serb, is exactly the model that Rome intends to use to make America Catholic. Now, if you compare what Avril Manhattan said in his book with history, 
history that has long since been forgotten, but is brought back to your memory if you read books like Fox's Book of Martyrs and the history of the Waldenses and other such like books. You realize that Avril Manhattan wasn't just making an outrageous statement. Rome's been practicing, has made a literal science out of persecuting the saints. During those 605 years and the, and the succession of 83 consecutive popes, Rome literally made an industry out of, out of torture, and they made mechanical drawings that became more and more and more sophisticated as the centuries rose made a literal science, a technological colossus of designing torture instruments. And the, even give the tolerances with which thumb screws, uh, knee breakers, waterboarding, stretching on the rack, interrogation methods. It's an entire science in the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, Ratzinger, the, the last pope, uh, before Francis I was the prefect of that organization. And he was well aware of the history of the Inquisitions. And, and, and most people think erroneously that the Inquisitions are over. They simply mutated from what is, his, what is historically known of them to be just a circuit of priests that go around persecuting saints to the tune of 50 million at least has now, has now been perpetrated upon the world in the form of world wars. And the perfect illustration of this is uh, the Vietnam War. I recommend the book, Vietnam, Why Did We Go? by Avril Manhattan. I recommend Avril Manhattan's book, Terror Over Yugoslavia. I recommend Vickers of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy. I recommend Fox's Book of Martyrs. I recommend the history of the Waldenses, and I recommend that you watch the video on YouTube called Jay Senovac and try to convince yourself that Rome does not yet kill, but that she kills beyond our comprehension. The wars of the world are crusades. You've heard it said by people just seemingly to speak off the cuff. Well, all the wars are religious wars. And few people realize just how true that is. I'm talking about even the current war in, 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 uh, in, in Ukraine. Most people are never told, especially not from the mainstream media, that Roman Catholicism is very powerful in, in Ukraine. And so is the Orthodox Church. And all of the war that's taking place in the Ukraine is simply to purge the heretics out of Ukraine. The, the, the mainstream media will never tell you about it because they're covering. We're never told that the wars that the United States have fought, World War I, World War II, and the current World War on Terror, we're never told that they're religious wars. We're never told that they're crusades, except for the fact that George W. Bush slipped one time and actually said on camera that it was a crusade. And, of course, the Roman Catholic bishops went, oh, 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 and they chastised him for that. Don't ever call it a crusade, because it might wake up the Protestants in this country. And... Uh, <coughs> For someone to say that the Crusades are over is simply an expression of unconceivable ignorance. And uh, we have the current world wars to prove it. And the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus won't be calculated until Christ returns. All numbers prior to that are fictitious. Look, the Bible, I'll take issue with, with what was said earlier uh, by... Uh, I don't know who it was, Nicholas or somebody, that we, we ought to forgive, you know. We ought to forgive all of this killing. But my Bible says forgiveness comes after repentance. You know, the sins, you know, some of our sins in, in ignorance, God winks at. But now, but now, 
It's time for all men to repent. Look, I disagree with this author. Why should I forgive the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus at the hands of the Inquisition of the Roman Catholic Church when in Revelation chapter 18, verse 4 and 5 says, Come out of her, my people. Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins. Because her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her sins. God is going to avenge every drop of innocent blood that the Roman Catholic Church has shed. God hath remembered her sins, and her sins have reached unto heaven. You can't stack sin any higher than heaven, can you? And there's well, been no re- there's been no repentance of the Roman Catholic Church for her killing. She calls it her good behavior when she kills heretics, the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. There is no repentance, and therefore there is no forgiveness. Look, you're, if you were to sin against me, and I brought to you my grievance, and you repented of your sin, The Bible teaches me I am to forgive you. Right. But what if you don't? I absolutely agree with you on that point. I uh, I already hesitated a little bit when I read that from Nicholas because I said you you cannot forgive sin without repentance. Listen, Um, let, let me just make it plain. When we are forgiven, the Scripture plainly says, our sins are cast from us as far as the east is from the west. And they're never to be mentioned again. When they are forgiven, washed, and atoned by the blood of Almighty God through Jesus Christ, our our Savior, our Messiah, they are as if we never sinned. Okay? Now, if Nicholas, or whoever was the author of that, uh, believes that we ought to forgive the sins of of the Inquisition, the sins of of the martyrs uh, that, that caused the martyrdoms of Christ, then we ought not to mention them, should we? Those well, sins are for, if those sins are forgiven, they are cast as far as the east is from the west. They are never to be mentioned again. So, uh, so this why whole is broadcast, this whole broadcast would be a new point? If, absolutely, uh, that uh, was the case. I agree this, with you on that one. Yes, this whole broadcast and everything Nicholas has said about the brutality, the cruelty, the satanic torture of God's people would be a sin in itself, wouldn't it? To yeah. keep bringing it up, to keep talking about it, you know that's the very argument that the Vatican uses against Protestants. We're to forgive and forget. We're Christians. You're to forgive our heinous sins. You're to forgive and forget the Inquisitions. You're to forgive and forget what we did to the Waldenses, what we did to the Albigenses, what we did to the Hussites, the Huguenots, all the slain of the earth. You are to forgive us and to forget our sins so we can commit them over and over and over and over again. Even to your day, they are going to kill the heretics of this country just like they killed the heretics. Look, the papacy has already said, when we get done mopping up the the heretic Muslims, we're going after the heretic Christians. They've already expressed their full intent that once they have eliminated the radical fundamentalist Islamists, they're going to eliminate the radical fundamentalist Christians. That's you, Yerk, and me, and I'm not about to forgive the sins that God hath remembered. The one place in the Bible it talks about the sins of the martyrs of Jesus underneath the altar, and they plead with the Lord, How long, O Lord, will you not avenge our blood? The Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. He will repay because he has not forgiven. He has, the sins have reached unto heaven and God hath remembered her iniquities. Even the souls of the saints under the altar plead for vengeance, plead for exoneration, plead that God will render his righteous judgment against the whore of Babylon the Roman Catholic Church, the murder of the saints of Almighty God. And I'm not about to forgive it, nor forget it. 
To forgive it nor forget it would be to silence Inquisition update. I would have no motivation to even take another breath. I would have no motivation to stand on the wall and warn God's people about the Inquisition that has come to America. And the world, this world is about to be deluged with the blood of heretics of every religion, just like the Vietnam War and the the crusade against the Buddhist, just like the the continual millennial link, millennial persecution of the Orthodox that split off, just like the persecution of the Protestants, the World War I, the World War II, who died in those wars? Protestants and Jews and Orthodox. I am not about to forgive nor forget the problem is that the world forgot. We place ourselves in spiritual and physical jeopardy if we forget who the Antichrist is and what role he plays in the world. That's right. I thank you very much, Tom, for this wonderful last sermon that you gave um, that will probably stay in all our minds but uh, we have to close the broadcast now for today and I'm very much looking forward to invite you to our next reading of the characteristics of the Antichrist and I'm quite sure that we will go even deeper than we have gone already now but what you just said this last 15 minutes reminds me so much of how you did the reading of Romanism and the Reformation which is another book that I want to advise anybody to read after all the books that you, of course, mentioned here. Um, Because to me, this is also a very important book. But of course, Fox's Book of Martyrs um, is an absolutely must read. And uh, by reminding our listeners to all the books that you've listed that should be read, all the videos that should be watched on YouTube, as long as they are available, people, time is running out Um, as long as we have access to all these things. I think it is nice uh, to close our broadcast right now because there's actually nothing that I can add to the sermon that you just gave to finish point 17 or characteristic number 17 of the Antichrist. And uh, we are only halfway in the document on page 66 of 123, so a little bit more than halfway. So... um, we will schedule the next broadcast of this uh, within a week, I guess. Um, we have to check the website for Michael when he advertises that the next um, episode will come with Tom Fress on um, this conversation. And uh, I thank anybody who has been listening up to now, and I thank, of course, everybody who is listening afterwards uh, online or even downloading this. I can only uh, advise you to download this broadcast to your hard drive on your computer and try to spread it with your family and your friends and everybody that you think who must listen to it and also everybody who you think who must not, not listen to it because there's always something new in the revelation that was given today by this only three points I think that we are of the characteristics of the Antichrist but um, absolutely there's even no doubt after reading the first point but still we have some eight points to go and um, I will put that to to another date. So I thank you very much, Tom, for your participation in this. And um, I want to close with uh, also thanking our Lord Jesus Christ to make this broadcast possible uh, in the way that we did that. Because we didn't do it for our sakes, we did it all for His grace and in His name. That's what we're doing this for. I want to bless everybody, and uh, I turn over to Michael to finish the broadcast. Thank you very much. God bless. Bye-bye. All right, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you, York. Um, well, folks, uh, a lot of things to think about. It's been mentioned in the past two hours, so I'm going to say God bless and have a good day um, and end the show. <laughs>